Well, we've got a really interesting guy here now. He's got 25 years in the U.S. national security, and he's a former CIA, and he's doing, uh, like, espionage international mystery. So, Adam Sykes, we're glad you're here. And what are you going to be reading for us today? I'm going to be reading from my debut novel, Landslide, which, uh, as you suggested, Al, is an international spy thriller set in Europe and ends up in war-torn Ukraine. It's a story about loyalty, lies, redemption, and uh, a gentleman trying to figure himself out. We're going to start in Frankfurt, Germany, in Chapter 1, with the protagonist, Mason Hack. man sitting across the table from me was a representative from the German Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy. He embodied the quintessential German bureaucrat, shiny bald head, wire rim glasses, slender physique, and a crisp gray suit. He spoke methodically, laying out everything in an organized and unambiguous fashion, his pronunciation precise and curt. He was clear and direct, emotionless, getting right to the point. I preferred working with people like him. I didn't have to sift through any convoluted nonsense obscuring the crux of the matter. My boss, Alastair Rutfield III, sent me to meet with him. It wasn't my first, it wasn't my usual sort of trip, no conflict zones or crime bosses, but I didn't mind. I go where the firm tells me. Jack Thompson, the partner who typically handles government interactions, had a personal thing so he couldn't go. I think his wife is leaving him or he's leaving her. I'm not sure, and it's none of my business. Nonetheless, this trip is a nice reprieve. I like Germany, the efficiency, the logical organization, the simplicity, not to mention the beer and the food. And unlike my usual trips, there aren't any triggers here to conjure up the demons. I enjoy some blissful forgetfulness. Tonight I'll go to Applevine, Solzen. They have an excellent roasted pork knuckle that's sure to give me heartburn, but it's worth it. There are worse things in life. So here I am in Frankfurt, one of Europe's great financial hubs. On behalf of Rutfield & Leeson, Rutfield for short, a global financial firm based in the city of London, we occupy floors 37 through 40 of the Leiden Hall building and handle corporate accounts for an international defense firm and energy multinationals. They may have been the robber barons of the 21st century, but someone has to invest their money. But unlike the financial giants Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, and Credit Suisse massive firms in the bulge back bracket offering a 50-page menu of services, Rutfield is a boutique. It's not everything for everybody and doesn't need to be to do what it does well. Like I said before, it's good to keep things simple. As for my position in the firm, I'm not a senior partner nor a top analyst. I can crunch numbers and read the markets. One can't survive in this arena without knowing that stuff. But my expertise falls elsewhere. I go to the places other bankers won't. The warlord-controlled rare earth mines in South Africa, the pirate-infested shipping lanes in the Gulf of Aden, the lawless border regions of the former Soviet satellite states, and most recently, the war-ravaged Syrian desert. In these garden spots, I talk with the local businessmen and government officials, but I also seek out the paramilitary power brokers and mafia types who wield as much leverage on international markets as the bureaucrats and corporations. It's this ground truth that gives Rutfield a nice edge over its competitors, and they pay me hands handsomely for doing what I do, which I don't mind, even if sometimes I wonder if I deserve it. Not surprisingly, all mo most of the senior partners find value in the information I gather. They also whisper about me at the holiday parties and as I pass by their offices. I don't make a show of things. I keep to myself quite well, but they know the rumors. Whether there is any truth to this or that story, and allegedly there are some deuces, it doesn't matter. I'm not keen on setting the record straight. I don't see the point. Consider me however you want. I'm an American, a rebel colonial from across the pond, and a former U.S. Marine. I fought in Bush's wars, and after 20 years of picking a fight with just about every country on the planet, the Brits view us Americans differently. It might take a generation or two to get back to being the chummy cousins we once were, if ever, but I hope we do. My meeting commenced within an hour of my arrival in Frankfurt. I took British Airways Flight 902 out of Heathrow, which I've already taken 20 times this year alone, usually with a connection sending me elsewhere. I had a chance to chat with Trish for a spell while we were in the air. I've known her for quite a while. She's a flight attendant, and this is her route. She's a nice gal, a bit younger than my 38 years, but she likes me for some reason. The plane touched down in Frankfurt at 9.45 a.m., and an analyst from Ruckfield Satellite Office, Klaus, picked me up from the airport and drove me straight here. The briefing by the ministry official had been droning on for the past 30 minutes, but I'd heard everything I needed in the first five. Germany was actively exploring options for other energy reasons, natural gas, coal, oil, which was no real surprise. The situation in the Middle East was too volatile, 
Putin had kicked off a killer dance party, and like the rest of Europe, Germany needed stable energy. Relations with the United States had become unpredictable in recent years, too, which didn't help matters. It's their own fault, and I can, I can only shake my head. Germany's new direction, however, means investment opportunities. Only a fool would ignore them, and Alistair and the rest of the partners at Rutfield are no fools. While the German talked, I let my eyes wander to the flat screen television mounted on the far wall. The day's financial stats were scrolling at the bottom. The main newscast was about the conflict in Ukraine. BBC World News reporting on Russian aggression in the region. The annexation of Crimea a few years back had only been the start. Incursions and support to separatists in Donetsk and Luhansk had been next. Off and on, on and off, cease fire and then return fire, pull back and move up, then invasion. Never end, never does. Only the Russian steam roller, formerly limited soldiers and tanks, included businessmen and conglomerates with offshore bank accounts and commanding positions on the stock exchange. Once the Kremlin security forces established control, the economic tentacles slithered in. It was all very imperial-like, maybe a little hops here. From the closed captions, I could discern the talking heads were reporting on the detention of a Western journalist by pro-Russian militants. A freelancer had been near the border when he was kidnapped. Rumors gleaned from the locals indicated the militants suspected he was spying and not a legitimate journalist. But that was typical. Every foreigner is a spy in places like that. When I visited Ukraine a while back, well before this mess, I had been careful to register with the right offices, bribe the right officials, and make it abundantly clear I was with a financial investment firm, not any government. The last thing I ever wanted was to get talked into a Ukrainian or Russian prison cell. After the perfunctory beating to get things going, they enjoyed drilling holes in your teeth and hammering your knees to loosen the tongue. No thank you. But when the BBC displayed a picture of the missing journalist on the screen, a vice clamped down on my chest, and I stopped breathing. I stared, riveted, unable to tear my eyes away. I recognized the hair, those eyes, that jaw, and the bold-ass grin. It was his face. My best friend, my comrade in arms, the man I went to twice to war with, and the man I'd risked my life trying to save. I'd know his face anywhere. But that guy was dead. Kevin Gomez died over 15 years ago on a blood-soaked gurney in the heart of darkness. Yet his picture appeared on the television plain as day, and apparently he was alive, but with someone else's name. Well, fantastic. So that was your, this is from your debut novel. So um, how are you finding it being a first-time writer? Really enjoying it. Get to travel a bit, get to do what I love, and tell some stories that maybe have changed a little bit from real life experience. Yeah, certainly. Well, we're glad you came on.